Welcome to Seth Marketing Academy. This lecture is again not on marketing per se, but more on management and leadership. And the title of the lecture is Surviving and Thriving in Tough Economic Times. It was primarily inspired by a company to say, after the 2008 recession, what should we do when the economy is not growing, the wealth creation has been destructive, people have lost money on their home investment, they have lost money in their 401k, there is a huge pessimism, what do companies do during tough times? That was the start of my preparing this lecture. I want to set the context before I get into the content. The first thing is that the Great Recession of 2008, as it is called, has very little parallel to Great Depression. I just always get amused and sometimes irritated when people compare the two. The real benchmark, surprisingly, is what happened in the U.S. economy after the first energy crisis of 74, 78 and the restructuring of the American economy in the early 80s, for example. Large corporations with enormous amount of brands, products, were so undervalued and therefore they were picked up by private equity companies, either a hostile takeover like KKRs, takeover of RGR Reynolds, for example, in Nabisco, or by more benevolent private equity people like Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. But either way, they enabled or they encouraged or they forced complete restructuring. We exited many industries. At a more macro level, we simply said, why should we be in the television industry, the watch industry? Those are all low margin, low value add activities, let Japanese have it. And we decided to go into more higher valued, higher margin products and you saw the growth of the Silicon Valley which is all a phenomenon from the 80s essentially. And we created enormous wealth. Third, as an anecdote because I want to point out that under tough times there is always an opportunity. I remember analyzing the beer industry and while the big boys or the big brand names were all struggling to survive and they engaged in what we call the beer wars, such as the Anheuser Busch with Miller and both of them when they fought for market share through advertising dollars, trade promotions, pricing, however they did it, the number three, number four, now number five companies all collapsed, Schlitz, Pabst, etc. But at the same time, 240 microbreweries grew. Isn't that interesting? So under tough times, there are opportunities where you thrive and under tough times, there are ways to restructure your cost structure, for example. That's the ultimate essence of this lecture. So the fundamental shift in business that took place in the 80s is again repeating back again now in uh, let's say year 2011-12. From what used to be a growth driven economy, now the economy is focusing on just recovery. I mean we are still better off that we have a hope for recovery, but think about Japan. We call it a lost, a lost decade for example and it may be two decades. But don't underestimate the Japanese surviving and thriving through probably one of the toughest decades that they have gone through. The tough decade that is about to begin is for the European Union. Beyond the crisis of Greece and Spain, there is a fundamental question whether the vision and the dream of creating European Union is viable or should have been ever created given all of the national sovereign policies with regard to the currency, with regard to trade, with regard to everything. And everybody is worrying about more the future of European Union whether in fact a country like Germany 
which can rebound, can afford to subsidize countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, etc. And the answer is clearly Germans would rather not subsidize anybody other than Germans, which makes sense. And Germany has gone through a painful experience very recently during the collapse of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. One of the biggest mistakes that Helmut Kohl made as the chancellor of the nation was to integrate East Germany, ex-communist country, on an equal footing with West Germany for whatever political agenda and the economy went on a tailspin from unemployment less than 3, 4 percent shot up to 10 percent and Germany has not been the same ever since. Now you talk about the burden of European Union for example. So neither France nor Germany have the stamina, the wherewithal to really bail out other nations. So they have even a tougher time than what we have. So fundamentally nations, companies are all saying uh, how do I just position for recovery rather than go for growth right now if there is a growth, maybe it's only in emerging markets. So you race into the emerging market, such as China, whether you are a Coca-Cola, a McDonald's, for example, or a Home Depot, or whoever you are, essentially. So that's clearly one. Because of that, I have created a second dimension that we all tend to have local mindset or domestic mindset. Because that is how we grew up, that is how we made money, that is how we organized culture, processes, everything within a company. And now the growth is going to come somewhere outside the nation, outside all the advanced countries, such as emerging markets that I mentioned to you. And that is the fundamental shift in the way people are thinking. So cash flow management, as opposed to net income, or revenue growth, which is a typical measure of uh, a company. Those are the two that analysts ask every quarter. Did your revenue grow next year, next quarter, or compared to last quarter? Did you have an earnings growth, as they call it? My view is that the biggest thing to watch under tough economic times is how much cash do you have? Can you survive? Can you weather the storm? And do you have better, in fact, uh, shutters and you have the better in fact uh, plywood that you have nailed down so that if and when the storm comes you are still there while your neighbor's buildings have collapsed. So cash flow management is key to surviving and thriving. Not only surviving but also for thriving because with that cash flow I can make acquisitions, I can diversify, I can do other things. So what I have done is to identify three strategies for survival and three strategies for thriving in tough economic times. Let's go over all of those. There is a chart and I will go with each one of them individually. Uh, the first thing I find is just do an audit of all your cost centers. In the heydays of the good economy, when you are growing very well, you always have a tendency to expand, add more cost structure because you have the optimistic outlook. And what happens therefore, we have lots of costs that are unnecessary. So here are two techniques that can be done. It happened again in the 80s, we created a whole new practice called re-engineering the corporation created the buzzword like outsourcing, downsizing, right sizing is the same in 2008 recession. What I've done is that the simplest audit I can do is all my cost centers, however I have defined them, whether those are production cost centers or those are marketing cost centers, those are support staff functions, whatever they are, I do a complete audit of those and I find again and again that 90 percent of your costs are concentrated into 10 buckets. Interestingly, rather than target across the board, you identify those 10 top cost centers and make sure that you are make doing it more efficiently or make sure that you are improving the productivity out of that one. So one has to identify. 
one of the biggest weaknesses in companies is the biggest cost center in most companies, especially manufacturing, is procurement. We have only taught to managers economies of scale in terms of the value add that we do through labor, capital, management, which turns out to be less than 30 percent of the total cost of any output. 70 percent is all procurement and procurement is one of the most inefficient functions in every company that I have been engaged in. So I go after procurement first and identify where I may get economies of procurement by either processes centralization or procurement centralization. In fact, I think no company can get a better job in the CXX, the top management leadership, than have a position called chief procurement officer. And I would strongly recommend not reporting to the finance VP, although today after Sarbanes-Axley Act, CFO is the number two position not the chief operating officer. So it may be still okay, but I prefer that the chief procurement officer, the chief human resource officer, the chief financial officer, and maybe the chief information technology officer, the CIO, ought to be a team led by the CEO. Company. It's a very simple exercise, by the way. <coughs> They're staring at you, but without numbers, you could not justify you could not communicate to your employees or to your analyst where are you going to have cost cutting. The typical budgeting process unfortunately has sort of a across the board cut, 5 percent cut across everything. I don't know whether you know, but we did invent in the toughness of the 80s two concepts. Both are equally valuable, I think. One is a zero base budgeting. In other words, whatever the budget last year, you don't continue or increase or slightly cut. You simply say the budget is just not available till you justify why you need the budget. And a second concept and even more powerful I think we created was what is called activity based costing. Rather than doing the traditional cost accounting which was based upon the industrial age and manufacturing uh, mindset. The costing here is totally different. I'm very fond of activity based costing myself, for example. That's clearly one recommendation. Second one is automate and outsource. By the way, again, the 2008, the role model or understanding is again 1980s because there, out of the total number of job losses, my estimates are running that 70 percent was through automation. Even when uh, we had very expensive computer systems, what we call the legacy systems, the mainframe computers, but companies automated everything. For example, automobile manufacturing assembly, they automated with robots. Engineering function, design and engineering, we came out with CAD CAM technology, computer assisted design, computer assisted manufacturing, and these uh, platforms would be half a million or more just on the software. But we said it is worth investing that and we created an enormous surplus of very talented engineers and scientists. So as a nation what do you do? You transform them from being scientists and engineers in the company to becoming high school teachers where we simply don't have enough school teachers generated by traditional colleges of education in science, math and technology. So that's clearly one. Outsourcing is only about 30 percent and more interestingly any function, HR function, IT function, marketing function makes no difference. 30 percent that is outsourced, not automated, 50 percent of the 30 percent is all the next door outsourcing. In other words, you outsource to a vendor who is in the same geography as you are or insist that vendor should install capacity in the same geography depending on the amount of uh, I guess the business you give them as an outsourcing contract. Next area that we need to think about is re-engineering, sourcing and supply chain which I already mentioned. IBM has gone through that. IBM as you know is a reincarnated company. They almost collapsed and came back in a very interesting, very positive way and I will give some examples. 
But IBM decided that they would, should not have their global sourcing uh, chief procurement officer based in Armonk or in New York City, where the vendors have to come. You will have a lot more understanding and more negotiating power if you are where the vendors are. So they shifted the whole thing to Shenzhen in China. And they procure lots of components, as you know, to make uh, legacy systems or servers nowadays, the blue box, whatever it is. And of course, they uh, might even have the sales and marketing organizing organization shift because more and more growth is coming from the Asia market. In fact, the largest talent pool of employees for IBM may be India number one, which is number three or four, surpassing Japan and surpassing the United States. You have to think out of the box very quickly. We have seen the same thing about Apple. I mean, Apple doesn't make things. It designs it, tight quality control, and drives Foxcom as a key vendor to come out with products which world allows, whether it's iPhone, iPad, or the old iTunes uh, uh, kind of a device. Amazon is the same way. They have pretty much re-engineered their whole sourcing, which is why Amazon is doing so very well in terms of their supply chain. Third survival strategy, and the one that I think is so fundamental to eliminate cross-subsidies. The traditional theories of survival, that if I can be a low-cost producer, if I have the scale I will survive is bunk. I'm so sorry to be so assertive in my comment because I've done lots of work to show you that if you have a cross subsidy in the business which economists never thought about it, then the David always wins against Goliath. And of course, we have a lot of cross subsidies by customers, cross subsidies by products, cross subsidies by markets, geographical markets. And what I find, and I'll show you a chart in a moment, that we need to identify where the cross subsidies are. And if those are in the customer base, do we have the courage to say goodbye to customers who are not going to be profitable forever? And it takes an enormous leadership because the first people who will hold on to the customer, even though they are not profitable, will be your own sales and marketing organization. And how do you justify some customers where you've been losing money forever based on the audit of last three, five years? You call them strategic. Well, I understand strategic future investment is necessary, but you can't be perennially loss, losing proposition, loss making proposition. So strategic is a good idea so long as there's a commitment that you will make it profitable after six months or a year which most sales and marketing people are unable to do, is my experience. So cross subsidies is the one that you eliminate, and I'll come back to that point with a graph. The second one is divesting non-core businesses and non-core functions. There may be functions which you don't need to do. I mean, we clearly have contract manufacturing now, like the Apple example that I gave you, or Cisco systems. But I think we also now have third-party distributors or third-party warehousing, big event. People are saying, why should I have to own and operate my own warehouses? Because competing products truck all go to the same geography where everybody has their warehouses. It's like a server farm, there is a warehousing farm. There's a duplication of resources. In Europe, they even allow cartels created for certain operational functions if the economies of scale will come when you share those functions or logistics or whatever it is. And that's what we are learning how to do it. How can we work with our competitors in a cooperative way to have a common reduction in cost so that's really what happens. So either a function or even businesses that are not really core to what you do. And divestment doesn't mean making no money. Divestment means you sell a brand, let's say, in consumer packaged goods, and that brand is an enormous value. 
Divestment means you break up the company into two parts. Have you seen that happening right now where companies like Kraft General Foods, Abbott Laboratories are all now creating to say we have two different businesses. We have a core business and a non-core business. Rhythms are different. We'll create two separate shares and two separate publicly traded companies. By the way, it also happened in the 80s. Remember that, same thing happened. But the private equity guys were more active. This time, private equity guys are in the back, not owning and controlling the company. It did happen at Coca-Cola. When uh, it was so undervalued in the early 80s that Berkshire Hathaway invested, I'm told, at about $4 billion valuation. And they immediately divested Columbia Pictures, a water business, in fact, a uh, wine business, saying that go back to your core business. Same thing happened with all television networks in the 80s for your information. CBS expanded. We are not a television company. We are in recreation and entertainment business. So they bought out resorts, they bought out publishers, and collapsed. So the Tisch family bought them out, private equity people, and made it into Viacom Group. NBC followed immediately. This is another uncanny thing. Uh, we follow competition more than we follow customers. NBC collapsed. It was bought out by General Electric, which has just divested now. And ABC was bought out by Cap Cities, which is a private equity firm. And eventually, it was sold to the Disney uh, Corporation. So all three networks basically were taken over by private equity because there was no public equity share price value out there. They were all highly undervalued. So let's go back to the chart that I was talking about. So if you plot, for example, whatever is your biggest revenue generating activity by customer, by product, by SKU within a product, I don't care, from the biggest to the smallest, you will see the curve, which is in blue color, exponentially coming down. It's called Pareto's law in economics. Or in sales and marketing, we call 20-80 ratio. Every business has 20-80 ratio. In other words, 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. That's we all know. And we make sure that those key accounts or those key customers we don't allow competition to come in because they are your bread and butter. But when you plot the cost, surprisingly cost does not come down that sharply. So on the left side of the chart, you will see margin, which is revenue minus cost, is much fatter, greater. And on the right side, when the two lines cross, unfortunately, everything is cross-subsidization. Where did I learn this fundamental issue of an industry and a business cross-subsidization? Was the Bell system. The whole company, by regulation, was organized where you had to subsidize residential customers by charging more to business customers. You had to subsidize residential customers by charging more to small business, for example. So your margins in that business are very high in small business primarily because cost of networking is nothing for incremental revenue. So if I was a competitor, where would I attack you? I will attack into the small business market and take it away. Or I will attack large enterprises and make an offer, which is both a price offer if it's a single product, such as a long distance service, or if it's a whole enterprise system like putting a PBX, a switch, on the campus, on the university, on the corporate campuses. And I can offer a whole solution. You might remember, if you're old enough, we used to have Centrex lines, where the typical telephone company will have for each individual employee, managerial, clerical, will have their own dedicated line. Very expensive proposition. Well, I can put a switch on the campus, and all large enterprises have their own switch. And then I can reduce the number of lines for which I'm paying to the baby bells or any local telephone company. It's just obvious game to play as a competitor. And I tell you, they lost enormous revenue on the landline side we are talking about. So it is not sustainable. 
a David with 5% market share actually can attack with impunity and bring down a Goliath, as MCI almost did it in the long distance against AT&T, what was called long lines, which was the ultimate place where they subsidized with that high margin everything the telephone companies did. You can get rid of the cost also. So for example, before the recent changes, maybe 20, 25 years ago, for any change in your telephone service, the technician came. The Bell system had a study to find that the minimum cost, loaded cost, of a technician visiting your home was $90. And they had at least 100 million visits a year in the residential customer alone. There are about 900 million dollars, a billion dollar subsidy because we never charged customers. You could not raise the rates because the commissions are not allowing you, which is a regulated pricing mechanism. So Bell Labs stepped in and redesigned the telephone where I just plug in. I don't have the technician come, I buy my handset, landline we are talking about, and come home, unpack it, put all the wires behind, connect into the socket and it works. As with wireless, we have seen a lot more innovation the same way. So these are the three recommendations for surviving. What are the three recommendations or strategies for thriving in tough times? The first thing I found is that the traditional segmentation that we do by demographics or SIC codes for business customers, standard industrial classification, the type of business that we serve, the value add we do because they are different, such as hospitals are different than banks, which are different than retailers, just is not enough. What you find in every market, some markets are growing very fast. So you begin to reallocate resources from low growth or no growth segments to high growth or huge potential growth segments. So you have to analyze the markets by growth rates. How will you define the markets? By geography. In emerging economies, we find, contrary to all of our prior belief systems, that the fastest growing markets for uh, branded Western products are in rural part of the countries like in Africa. Rural part of India, rural India is growing faster than metro India. Same thing in China. And not limited to packaged goods, but that's true for motorcycles. That is true for television now, in fact, inter interestingly. Definitely true for cell phones, just goes on. So the growth rates is a better way to look at the markets and see what we can do. And generally, there are three segments. There's a premium segment who has a high willingness to pay for a superior product or a superior service. Then there's a value segment which is demanding uh, for the price they pay, what is the value they are getting. Walmart has a good, done a good job into the value segment. For example, McDonald's has done a great job by promoting value of what you eat at McDonald's. And of course, premium segments has been all the luxury brands. Have you seen there is no end to the growth of luxury brands in emerging markets, such as a BMW or a Gucci? It's just incredible. It's contrary to our belief system. So we need to park our belief systems and look at the same market from a different perspective, which is the growth rate. And uh, third one is a service segment, where people say, I would like not to be self-served. I would like somebody else to serve me. And you get paid for that. So there is always that service segment, as we call it, where somebody would say, either I'm incompetent or I don't have the time. You remember we had a home grocery delivery business, web one that failed, but it had to do with operational things, not with customers. And the biggest example where they succeeded very well in making it more convenient was, as you know, Domino's Pizza. I deliver to your doorsteps in half an hour or money back guarantee and rest is history from what was a small specialty pizza company almost became number two and almost topple the undisputed leader called Pizza Hut for, I don't know, incredible uh, market share they gained. 
A geographic differences in market rates is very important in growth rates. So, I look at geographic, and geographic doesn't mean country by country. I mean uh, very much like a metro areas, SMA, statistical metropolitan areas. I would even go to the zip code level. I will go to the neighborhoods, for example. It's very micro, as micro as you can get into the geographic clusters that you can create. Second strategy is a mandate for new growth, which says that company will chug along. People in charge of products and people in charge of markets will simply say, I'm doing better than last year. They are not challenged. And I saw this happen at 3M company. New CEO came from inside succession planning, Jacob Jacobson or Jake Jacobson. And the first thing he did was to do an audit of each of the product divisions they have, and they have multiple product divisions. They're very large, multiple product company, as you know, great company. And simply says that 90% or more revenue that we are earning has come from products that were actually innovated five, six, ten years ago. 90% of the revenue comes from customers we already have. So he basically said each of the CEOs of product divisions, such as, for example, scotch tape, such as, for example, in fact, automotive sector, where they provide a lot of plastic products into the automobile companies like Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, and simply said, I would like you to grow much faster. So what can you do, grow 20, 25% faster from products that just don't exist today? which leads to innovation, and here is a company that's famous for innovation, but their processes were very legacy. 30, 40 years, they were behaving the same way. So you create a spark. You create a mandate. You create a transformation, and that's how 3M came out. Coca-Cola's growth plans is mind-boggling to see how they're investing $6 billion in China, and maybe $4 billion in India, putting all the bottling capacity because the expectation is that the number of cities today 1 million and above population let's say about two three hundred or so in the worldwide will be 4,000 cities by 2020 or 2025 mostly in emerging markets and China will have the largest number of million plus population cities very quickly so you can now put bottling plant for a city because you have economies of scale and therefore, they're investing massively in their bottling company primarily. And a strategic investment in growth markets, which is another thing. So companies like Unilever or companies like steel companies, companies like you know telephone companies, it doesn't matter which industry, are all going toward China because China has become not only the largest sourcing destination, it's still not the largest. Largest is America, please. But China is a good second sourcing place for manufactured products. But the bigger opportunities are China's domestic consumption and domestic demand. Automobility is now as big as America. It is true for cell phones. It is true for consumer electronics. It is true for steel. It is true for any industrial commodity or agricultural commodity. It is the largest market in the world in many product categories. So you can say, I don't want to go to China for sourcing. I want to go to China to participate in China's growth. So that's clearly what it means around here, wherever the growth is. And by the way, very nice anecdote. Home Depot, a large retailer, about $90 billion, based in Atlanta, suddenly realized that doing business in China is not going to work because China does not believe in do it yourself because labor is still so cheap. It believes in do it to me. So this self-creating products or do it yourself just didn't have the market. Or they entered too early. So they be, be decided to get out of China and come back to North America where they're doing quite very well in Mexico, in Canada. But according to the interview by the CFO, the largest growth for Home Depot is in their home country. There are so many markets that Home Depot still has not touched, and you can grow forever. So wherever the growth is, you go and strategically invest and mandate accordingly reallocation of resources 
both capital and management talent. And the last one around here to thrive is hit them where they ain't. Of course, I talk about the microbreweries example. I talked about, for example, the, uh, or I can talk about, for example, same thing happened in soft drinks while Coca-Cola and Pepsi traditional products are struggling. The new age beverages, energy beverages, sports beverages, sports beverages are just coming in a big way. So hit them where they ain't. There are segments and there are markets that people haven't thought about. So Dollar General is in that category. I was very surprised to see that not a single Dollar General store has failed so far. Because they go even deeper into rural market than Walmart did. It's Walmart all over again. Learn how to serve very small communities, aggregate the demand, and then come to the metro area. As opposed to the Sears model, Kmart model, where you come with the metro and then you go to smaller towns and the cities. This is called hit them where they ain't because that was the phrase Sam Walton used when people asked him, how can you compete with world class companies like Sears and uh, uh, Kmart? And his answer was that hit them where they ain't. They will never show up in small towns. So now you have to create a supply chain to serve the small town consumers who usually have to come to a market once a week, like a farmer's market, but for regular products, or order it by mail order, but now you are making it convenient to be right in their backyard. iTunes, iPhone, iPad, they're all the same things. Hit them where they ain't. I mean, tablet business. Who said PC or cell phone? There's something else. And suddenly that goes into creating a brand new market. So you are not really competing. You are creating a market, expanding the market essentially. This is also often called the blue ocean strategies. Uh, there are a couple of scholars out of INSEAD who have written a great book in strategy. It says that don't think about the traditional oceans where you participate either as a military force or commercial things. Think about oceans you have never explored as yet. It's called a blue ocean strategies. It's the same as what we talked about. So let's conclude. This economic recession of 2008 is real. It is deep. I don't think we'll get out of it instantly, as we all Americans are so impatient we like to do it. And it is global. It's not American. It is European. It is Japanese, all advanced countries. Companies must learn to adapt to the new reality to survive and thrive. So the only reason companies fail is if they are unwilling or unable to adapt to the changes in the environment. The three survival strategies are audit all cost centers and focus on that 90-20 ratio. Re-engineer sourcing and supply chain, not marketing and not other internal functions. And eliminate cross subsidies, which we talked at length. The three thriving strategies are segmentation by growth rates, not by demographics, psychographics, SIC codes. Mandate, top management mandate for new growth, which means the traditional legacy growth, 90% of the business tomorrow will be from the same customers and the same products as yesterday. Only 5% is the incremental growth, you flip over and make a whole transformation to say 25, 30% of our revenue will come from markets we have never been there or products we don't have it in our portfolio. And as I say, 3M company that worked very well. And hit them where they ain't, which is really the Walmart phrase, but happily done by Dollar General in retailing, or by microbreweries, or by New Age soft drinks. And there are so many industries where you see the same pattern. When the big boys are struggling, you have the opportunity for niche players or niche companies by and large. I hope you enjoyed this lecture also. Thank you very much. <laughs>